Fun. So that uh, everybody will see you. You don't need to see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they want to know the speaker. <laughs> it's not too often that they get to interact with you. So it is such a special privilege today uh, for all of us. So it's uh, 30 degrees centigrade in Oxford, uh, which for you is nothing serious, but for Oxford is a very unusual situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would think so. <clears throat> Ill-prepared. Do we know anything about how many people will attend? Well, uh, uh, we, we have to see because, uh, uh, you know, when we have a speaker from a different time zone, um, it is always uh, difficult for people to physically attend the talk. Okay. So okay. what most of them uh, do is to catch up on the recording, which will be available. Okay, cool. Uh, so we will have a few, but uh, most of them are going to catch up on the YouTube uh, sometime soon. Okay. Yeah, it is evening 5.30 now, uh, nearing 5.30. Okay. Stanil, if you turn on your camera, let me introduce you to Professor Davis. Oh, okay. That's actually unfortunate. Okay, maybe I can oh, join. Yeah, I can join through uh, the phone because I am joining through a desktop oh i see that. okay all right okay no yeah. don't worry don't worry but let me let me just yeah. um, uh, share this with professor davis sunil is uh, on the faculty of the indian institute for science education and research at tirupati and uh, he's one of the program coordinators for um, this activity and uh, um, he along with dr arijit sharma uh, they run this program, this center. Uh, we are also joined by Professor Alu Alia, who you see on the screen now. Hi. Uh, Professor Alu Alia is the president of the Indian Association for Physics Teachers. Great. And uh, he's at Shimla. Uh, they have been having torrential rains and uh, landslides and difficult weather <laughs> right that's the future for all of us <laughs> yes and it's getting close to the time for the talk but we have another four minutes i think mm. oh, cool Mm. Oh, yeah. What is the total time that I should speak for? 
uh, not very rigid. Um, maybe 50 odd minutes, 50, 60 very minutes. Good. Very good. 50 minutes will work. Yeah. Okay. Thereabout. Do we have uh, Utpal Roy with us as yet? There he is. Um, Utpal? Hello, Utpal. Is there somewhere? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Good to have you, Utpal. Yeah, nice to right. see you. So, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Utpal Roy also to you, Professor Davis. He is uh, at the Indian Institute of Technology at Patna. So, IIT is a family of institutions. There are several. Uh, the oldest ones are uh, uh, like more than 60 years old. But then there has been a second generation IITs and also a third generation IIT. So, so we belong to different uh, stages. And uh, Utpal, I would say, is from the second generation IIT. Uh, so it is northeast from Patna, close to the Himalayas, not very far. Good. Oh, I see Dima Budkar there. That's yes, it. Professor Budkar. Good afternoon. Wonderful yes, to have you. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, hi, Shemis. How are you? Dima, how are you? Long time no see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very excellent. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to your talk. <laughs> okay. So we have people joining in, even as we speak. Good. Where are you physically now, Seamus? Now I'm in Oxford. I'm in my office in uh, the Beecroft building in Oxford. And uh, outside the window behind me is Keeble College. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a different universe to Berkeley, I have to say. <laughs> Well, it is time, so should we start? Are we ready? Great, so good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And uh, oh, we are in for another very exciting talk today. So we always uh, think that quantum theory is so uh, counterintuitive and it shocks, uh, but in some sense, the theory is uh, shocks because nature shocks and uh, quantum theory only happens to describe it in a nice fashion. So one would wonder as to why we do not quite experience quantum theory on a regular basis. And uh, just what is quantum matter? Can we visualize it? Can we see it at some level? And we have a very distinguished speaker today, Professor Seamus Davis, and I, uh, invite uh, my colleague from the Indian Association of Physics Teachers, Professor Aluwalia, to please introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Professor Deshmukh. Uh, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome, Professor Davis. Uh, I feel very happy to introduce you to the uh, August audience here. Uh, Professor Davis is uh, a very distinguished physicist and uh, he explores the world of macroscopic quantum physics. Normally people think quantum physics is for microscopic world, but he's going to talk about macroscopic uh, quantum physics. And uh, he basically looks at exotic states of electronic, magnetic, atomic, and space-time quantum matter. And uh, 
He is a very distinguished uh, experimentalist with innovative instrumentation, where he has been able to directly visualize atomic scale perception of the quantum many body phenomena. Uh, Professor Davis uh, actually not only works at University of Oxford, where he is at the moment, he is also uh, part of University College Cork in Ireland and uh, at Cornell University in US. Uh, he also works at uh, Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids. So he is in fact, in true sense, a physicist who is a global physicist, I would put it like that. Uh, he is, in fact, uh, working in many areas besides macroscopic quantum phenomena, topological superconductors, electron pair density wave states, monopole fluids and insulators, condo metals and insulators, quantum and classical spin liquids, copper iron high temperature superconductivity, electron fluid flow visualization, and quantum microscope development. And the most uh, interesting part, uh, which is very impressive, is that he is a recipient of many awards. Uh, he is, in fact, a recipient of uh, Outstanding Performance Award of the Berkeley National Lab, Science and Technology Award of Brookhaven National Lab, London Prize for Research on Macroscopic Quantum Physics of Superfluids, Cameron Owens Prize for Research on High Temperature Superconductivity, Science Foundation Ireland Medal of Science, Luzana Prize for Pioneering Research into Visualizing Electronic Quantum Matter. I think uh, uh, Professor Davis is going to focus on this topic today. And Buckley Prize for Innovative Visualization of Complex Quantum States of Matter. So, Professor Davis, uh, welcome. And we are looking forward to listening to a very exciting talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alua, for uh, such a generous introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it. And uh, so I I will uh, share my screen and just launch into uh, into my discussion. Okay. Let me know if there's any glitch in the presentation. So I, I thought because I don't really know who everyone who's going to be in the audience, I thought I'd give a general survey of uh, what we have learned about visualizing quantum matter over the last approximately 25 years. So that's the good part. We've learned a lot. The bad part is 25 years of my life are gone, but there's nothing I can do about that. So, so I'll, I'll just walk you through the various issues that we would wish to study the techniques developed to make those studies and just touch on the scientific results that emerge from them. All right, so, so let's start. Imagine you have a gas or a fluid of uh, quantum mechanical particles. So they're de Broglie wave-like particles. They have a momentum, which goes as one over the wavelength and they're semi-classical. So they have an energy, which goes as the uh, momentum squared. And if they're in a crystal, well, the periodicity, the periodicity of the crystal then opens the famous energy gaps in the otherwise uh, quadratic band structure. And then if you have these free particles, you can fill them in, but they're fermions. So they each fill one state above the other until they reach the Fermi energy. Now, virtually all metals with which we're familiar, I mean, if you want to think of something, just think of gold. It's a beautiful example of this. All the states are filled up to a characteristic energy called the Fermi energy. And because of the band structure, that chooses some characteristic momenta called the Fermi momenta. The, sta the states above that are empty. They still exist, but they don't actually contain any particles. The states below are full. So this is the simplest world that we would like to study by visualization. Now, the thing about uh, your you know, piece of gold, actually gold is a bad example. I should have said lead. The thing uh, about most metals um, is that they're not thermodynamically stable. There's another lower energy state. And it's when the fermion at positive momentum plus K and the fermion at negative momentum minus K 
they bind together to make a quantum mechanical bound state. You could think of it like positron if you're a uh, positronium, if you're a high energy physicist, but here the two particles have the same sign. And then all those bound states fall into a macroscopic quantum state, which is what we call a superconductor. So when that happens, you end up in a very exotic situation. You started with a piece of metal. Um, a gap opens in the uh, in the dispersion of the excitation of the electrons as they cross the chemical potential. And now there's no single electron eigenstates near the chemical potential. In the sense of single electrons, it's actually become an insulator. Um, and that gap is related to how strong is the pairing of, of the particles to make the condensate. Then outside that gap, there's a new type of single electron excitation called a quasiparticle, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about that. But it's, it, it's analogous to an electron, but it's really a linear superposition of an electron and a hole. So you end up with, and, and now of course, superconductors are conductors, but all the conductivity is occurring in the two electron uh, Cooper pair condensate. So you end up with two fluids existing together. One is a fluid of charge 2E with no dissipation, a macroscopic quantum charged superfluid, which we call the superconductor. And the other fluid is a fluid of single electron uh, like excitations, which we call quasiparticles. So that's the world in which we work. Virtually everything I'm going to talk about could be encapsulated, you know, by a theorist by looking at this slide. Okay. Oh, I forgot one other thing. Of course, when you're binding two quantum mechanical particles together, they can bind in different angular momentum states. So they could find, make an S wave state, that'll make an S wave superconductor. Cooper pair is P wave, that'll make a P wave superconductor, et cetera, D wave, and so on. In this talk, I'm going to talk about S, P, and D wave experiments, which have been successful. So far, we haven't succeeded to find an, S, an F wave, uh, visualize an F wave compound, but if anyone in the audience knows of a good candidate, I would love to do it. Um, now, to see what's going on in these materials, we use what is now called a quantum microscope. So the scanning tonic microscope was originally invented in the 80s and used to visualize atoms, and they're brilliant at that function but they don't visualize the delocalized de um, de Broglie waves, which are propagating through the crystal. They just visualize where the atoms are. So I don't call our microscopes STMs. I call them quantum microscopes, and you'll see why. So the conventional scanning tunneling microscope, uh, you take a very sharp tip, and you know, these are, you can buy these, they're commercially available. You take a very sharp tip. Uh, it's got one atom on the end, you bring it near the surface of something you want to study. You bring it within a distance that the tunnel barrier for the electrons is low enough for electrons to tunnel through vacuum. Then if you apply a voltage between the surface and the tip, a current will flow. You measure the current. And now you use a feedback system while you're rastering the tip over the surface to keep the current constant. And then you make an image of what was the feedback voltage and you kind of call it an image of the atoms. It's not really an image of the atoms, but it is an image of their periodicity. And that image you see there on the screen is an image of the selenium atoms in niobium diselenide. But you cannot see where are the delocalized electrons in that image, right? The conventional STM doesn't give you that information. Now let's think how to get beyond that point. So. In tunneling, you have two metals and they each have a Fermi surface, a chemical potential. If the two Fermi surfaces are equal, no current flows, even if they're in tunneling contact with each other. But if you apply a voltage between them, let's say you raise the chemical potential of the tip uh, relative to the sample, then a current will flow. Or if you raise the sample relative to the tip, the current will flow in the other direction. Now there's two things going on here. One is the WKB barrier for, for tunneling through vacuum. And that will cause the current to be exponential in distance. Z is the distance between the sample and the tip. And there's some characteristic distance scale, which is the WKV decay length. And for most metals, that's about one extra. But the second thing that's happening is that the current uh, from Fermi's golden rule, the current is just the integral over all the field states for which there are empty states on the other side. So the current is the integral over the density of states in the sample up to the energy that you choose by setting the voltage between them. So the current is the integral over the density of states up to a known energy. 
So the derivative in the current, that's the differential conductance, is some WKB factor times the density of states um, at the point of the tunneling. Oh, and sorry, we assume the density of states in the tip is a constant, and we usually evaluate that carefully before we do any experiment. So that drops out of the equation. We're only measuring the differential conductance, and it's the density of electronic states in the material to which we're tunneling. Okay. And you know, here's a curve, differential conductance versus voltage. According to theory, it's density of states versus energy, where energy is electron charge by voltage at the location where the tunneling is occurring. Okay, no problem. So now you can imagine how to make a spectroscopic imaging STM. You take the STM tip and you put it at a given vectorial location R, and you have to turn off the feedback now. If you keep the feedback system on, then as soon as you change the voltage, the tip will crash into the surface. So you have to turn off the feedback. When the feedback is off, then you ramp the voltage and measure the differential conductance. And that would tell you the density of states as a function of energy at this atom, at the atom that you're looking at. Okay, now as a matter of logic, it's easy to figure out what you should do. Imagine you have a large field of view. This is about 30,000 atoms. And you want to know the density of states everywhere. So you take your STM tip and put it at the first atom in the top left-hand corner, and then measure the differential conductance and write down that function. So now you know the density of states versus energy for the first atom. Well, of course, you should go to the second atom and do the same thing again to the third atom, and so on, and so on, and so on. At the end of the process, you end up with data where we show the density of states as a color code Dark is low density of states. Bright is high density of states. And the density of states is different at every energy. So the number on the movie is the energy where the, the electrons are tunneling. So now you have density of states as a function of location, the same locations whose atoms you see in the left-hand side image. But now you also have it as a function of energy. So if I run the movie, you're running through all the energies of this measurement uh, for the density of states in the field of view on the left. So there it is. Uh, we introduced, you know, people knew in principle how to do this, but there's a lot of technical challenges to make it possible. So we introduced a powerful functional way of doing this in 1999. And originally it was actually very hard to publish these data because no one had ever seen something like an image of the amplitude squared of the wave functions of electron in a real material, especially resolved by energy. But that's what you see in the movie on the right hand side. Okay. So that's wonderful. It does work. Uh, now, it's technically very challenging to do this because the feedback system, which stabilizes all commercial STMs, has to be turned off. So the junction has to be mechanically stable without any feedback. When you put the tip 90 picometers from the surface, it should stay there, you know, without moving during the time of making the spectrum. And that's hard to achieve. So to see that, imagine if I took 512 by, uh, yeah, 512 by 512 pixels for this image on the left. And then in each pixel, I want to take a spectrum with 200 data points. So that, that's 50 million data points in the movie on the right. But if you want to make 50, and we have to do it serially, we don't know how to do it parallel. So if you want to make 50 million serial measurements in 24 hours, you only have a few milliseconds per measurement. And that means your bandwidth is three to 10 kilohertz. And that means you allow in a lot of noise. And furthermore, if you calculate, you know, you want the signal to noise to be, let's say, 100 to 1, then you can figure out the tip cannot move by more than about 10 femtometers during the measurement. It isn't to give you more spatial resolution. It's to give you enough fidelity in the measure of the, measure of the differential conductance that you can end up with a movie like this. So to achieve that, we originally, when I was at Berkeley, we had to do it in a cowboy fashion. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so now we're on the fourth generation of this technology. So we use ultra low vibration labs and ultra low temperatures because you have to diminish the thermal noise as well. So in the Beecroft building at Berkeley, where I'm standing right now, um, about 30 meters underground, we have four ultra low vibration labs. Each one, the floor of the lab is floating on its own vibration isolator. So the floor weighs about 30 tons and it's on six massive isolator air springs. 
So when we turn them on, the whole floor of the lab lifts up by about a centimeter. Then sitting in the floor in an acoustic isolate, isolated room upstairs, the whole thing is, um, well, if I think about it, it's about 30 feet high, yeah. Uh, so it, upstairs sitting on the floor of the lab is the ultra low vibration cryostat. So itself is massive. The walls and, and the top table are made of lead. So it weighs up to 10 tons, depending on the design. And then sitting on, and it has another layer of vibration isolation, then sitting on that table is a ultra low temperature refrigerator, let's say dilution fridge going down to 20 millikelvin. And then inside that fridge is a scanning apparatus to scan the tip. There's a real tip on the top right hand side. And then we introduce the sample from above and carry out the experiments. Here's a fourth generation of that design, of our design. This one is in uh, UCC in Ireland, actually. And here's a fourth generation, more or less the same design. This one is downstairs here in the Beecroft building in Oxford. All right, now what do you do with these toys? So here's an image of lithium iron arsenide, which is an important uh, high temperature iron superconductor. And you know the left-hand image is an image of the atoms at the surface and all of those, all of the nicely periodic and not disordered atoms are the lithium atoms at the cleave level. And the various other objects you see are defects, either missing lithium atoms, or often there's a missing iron atom um, in the layer below. Now on the right hand side, you see the differential conductance measured the way I told you at a certain energy, it's minus 7.7 .7 millivolts. And now I'll show you what, and that's in the same field of view as the left-hand side. So now I'll show you what happens if we vary the energy. A tremendous amount of action occurs in the spatial structure of the wave function squared of the electrons in this compound. Uh, and I'll come back and explain in more detail. I mean, it looks terrible. When we first got these results, we thought we had failed because it looks terrible. It just looks horribly disordered, but it turns out that all real materials, well, no, no, not gold and silicon and silver and platinum are not like this, but any complicated material is like this. It has this disorder at the atomic scale. Uh, so here's a heavy fermion superconductor, atoms on the left, heavy fermion wave functions on the right. That's the first movie ever made of the electronic structure of heavy fermions on the right. And it was very revealing, I'll show you why. Here's the one I already showed you, copper-based superconductor. This one was a big shock at the time that the copper-based superconductors are so ordered at some temperatures. Look at that image, it's ordered. But then at other temperatures, they're highly disordered. Uh, sorry, not temperatures, energies. At some energies, it's ordered, and some energies, it's highly disordered. Um, here is an orb the first orbital selective superconductor, and the movie is the density of states the first density of states ever made of an orbital selective uh, superconductor. Um, and here is a ferromagnetic topological insulator, which is very important for the quantum anomalous Hall effect. This was the first um, density of states movie made for a uh, ferromagnetic topological insulator. And this one, it'll turn black in a second. There's the direct mass gap in which there are of the surface state in which there are no eigenstates. And then when you exit from the gap, you see the states reappearing once again, here they come. So this is an incredibly powerful technique, but it seems its power seems to be merely to show you the disorder. Okay. All right, now let's think about this a little bit more carefully. So quasi-particle interference imaging. Imagine I have a de Broglie state um, look at the top left-hand side of the, of the slide here. It's got a wavelength, so it's got a wave vector, 2 pi over the wavelength. And now imagine there's an impurity atom and it scatters. Strong scattering potential, it reverse scatters. That doesn't, it's, ener it's elastic scattering, so the energy is the same, so the wave vector is the same, except it changes sign. But these two wave functions add constructively, they're in phase for strong scattering. And then if you take the amplitude squared, which is all we can measure, the, the, it will be modulating because you have an interference pattern. And the wavelength of the interference pattern is half the wavelength of the original uh, de Broglie wave, or the Q vector of the interference pattern is twice the Q vector of the original wave vector of the electron. Okay, 
Now imagine you have some random disorder. Each dot here is an impurity atom and you're visualizing the electronic structure the way I showed you. Then you could take the Fourier transform of this image and it would show you that in fact, although this looks disordered, in terms of wave vectors, it's highly ordered. The reason why it looks disordered is just that the impurities are at random locations. The wavelengths of the de Broglie waves are all the same. And then according to the simple theory, the Q vector is twice the K vector. So that would mean we could figure out the K vector, which is causing this scattering interference pattern. But now we have the energy. So you can measure the Q vector as a function of energy, and that tells you the K vector as a function of energy. And that tells you the band structure of the electrons. This is a way of finding the momentum space electronic structure of a material uh, without using photo emission or some other exotic technique, merely by direct observation. And for those of you of a certain age, you know that this is the Friedel effect, which is being used here to measure the band structure. All right. So now let's go back to our horrible image of, of um, disordered wave functions in, this is lithium iron arsenide, looks like crap, sorry. <laughs> uh, but now let's take, take this movie on the right hand side and just take the Fourier transform of that movie, nothing else, just take the power spectral density Fourier transform and you get this. There's only a very small number of wavelengths in that picture. And if you go outside the energy gap, there you have it. That's a picture of the Fermi surface of lithium iron arsenide derived directly from Fourier transform STM. And in this sense, quasiparticle interference is an incredibly powerful technique. Um, the best energy resolution of photo emission is maybe one milli electron volt, but the best energy resolution of tunneling uh, of QPI is now four micro electron volts, almost a thousand times better. And no photo emission machine can ever work in a high magnetic field, but this technique works just fine in a high magnetic field. So it has many additional attributes uh, beyond the typical electron spectroscopy. Uh, for the experts in the audience, what you're actually measuring is the imaginary part of the Green's function uh, at the same location as a function of energy, that's in real space. And in Q space, what you're actually measuring is the sum of the product of the Green's function at K and K plus Q, where Q is the interference wave vector multiplied by the um, scattering matrix element, which is often a constant. Okay. So now I showed you a picture of heavy fermion wave functions. Well, they look horrible, right? Like all real quantum matter, they look terrible. But if I take the Fourier transform of that movie, it's on the left-hand side. Here you can see the heavy fermion effect. Fermi surface shrinks, and then it jumps, and then it shrinks again, exactly as predicted by theory since the early 1980s. This is the first time that the um, heavy fermion gap could be observed in momentum space. It's only you know a fraction, maybe one or two millivolts wide. So here it was directly observable. Um, here's the one I showed you already. Here's, um, this is an orbital selective metal in which the carriers only come from one orbital of the atoms. And that was discovered by doing Fourier transform STM. From the symmetry of the scattering interference patterns, we could tell that only one orbital is contributing its spectral weight at the chemical potential. Um, it's the DZY orbital in this compound, which is um, iron selenide, if you're interested. And the one I showed you already, the horribly disordered cuprate superconductor, well, its Fourier transform is beautifully symmetric. It's got eightfold symmetry, and it has this structure because it's a D-wave superconductor with four nodes in the energy gap. And you know, you see it up to high energies because it's a high temperature superconductor. Okay. So now we have single electron imaging in real space and Fourier transform STM to find out what that represents in momentum space. Once the correlations become strong enough though, this picture will fail because eventually the electrons will become self-localized. We're not talking about disorder here. We're talking about the interactions become so strong. Well, the traditional case we all learn about is a Wigner crystal, but this isn't a Wigner crystal. This is in the strong coupling limit. Uh, the interactions become so strong that you can get an electronic liquid crystal. Now we all know what is a liquid crystal. It's a molecule whose orientation and periodicity can be manipulated by electric fields. And it's a trillion dollar business, which 
partially dominates our lives. But this is based on patterning and orienting uh, molecules, not electrons. Um, 1998, Fradkin and Kivelson and Vic Emery, God rest his soul, he's passed away, proposed that in strong coupling, if you put electrons, dope electrons into a Mach insulator, they will form electronic liquid crystals. So we had pursued that for a long time and succeeded, as you will see. Okay, so here is a picture of where the atoms are on the surface of a copper-based high temperature superconductor. TC is around 92 Kelvin. It's a serious superconductor. You can see the atoms, they're nicely ordered. It's, um, there's a strange modulation along the one one direction, but that doesn't influence anything I'm going to say here. Otherwise the atoms are in a nice tetragonal arrangement, one zero and zero one are equivalent. And if you would guess, you would say, okay, if I image the wave functions of the superconductivity, you know, the gap edge wave functions of the superconductivity, maybe it'd be a little bit disordered, but you know, one wouldn't expect any extraordinary effect, unless if you knew about electronic liquid crystals. So when we did that imaging in exactly the same field of view, this is what you see. The electrons are self-organizing themselves in real space in a very complicated way. It looks like kind of Irish tweed, actually bad Irish tweed. But, uh, and so you see, and the pattern of where the atoms are is much simpler than the pattern of, pattern of where the electrons are. So it is a very complicated, self-organized, but we now know it is an electronic liquid crystal. Um, I show you the energy dependence of the same phenomenon on the right. You can see that the patterns don't evolve with energy. That tells us it's localized states, not quantum interference. At the lowest energy, we don't see them very clearly, but as we exit at the edge of the, here they come again now. They're in exactly the same place. They make translational symmetry in exactly the same way. So they are localized stationary eigenstates, self-organized in what is otherwise quite a pure crystal. Uh, so here's two different materials. There was a good, you can imagine, there was a good deal of skepticism about these results when they first came out, uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago. So we tried two completely different cuprate crystals. Their crystal symmetry is different. Uh, their term, their uh, termination layers are different. Essentially, they're as different as they possibly could be, except for one thing. They have the same density of electrons uh, doped into the Mach insulator, okay? And on the left, you see, I think, uh, the chlorine atoms of oxychloride. And on the right, you see the bismuth atoms of bisco. Now, if we look at the electronic structure at this low doping, what do we see? You see exactly the same, highly disordered, but internally consistent picture of the self-organization of the electronic structure in these materials. Um, if I didn't tell you which one was which one, and you're not an expert, you'd be hard pressed to tell that these were two completely different materials, except for the fact that their unit cell is dominated by the CuO2, uh, orbitals, uh, the, the D9 orbital on the copper atom and the 2P6 orbital on the oxygen atom. And they have the same number of carriers. Aside from that, they're completely different, but you can see they form the same real space structure. Now you can say, what is that structure? So we could zoom into this disordered pattern a little bit carefully. Now you see a unidirectional thing. Many people call this thing a stripe. Can zoom in a little bit more. You see that stripe in full detail. Uh, let me, I need to close this. Okay, you see that stripe in full detail. But we, I showed you, we know where the atoms are. So it isn't just seeing the stripe, it's, uh, oops, excuse me. It isn't just seeing the stripes. We know where the atoms are. So we know where the electrons are localized relative to the copper atoms which are black and oxygen atoms, which are blue. And if you look at that pattern, you'll see that it's a very strange pattern. It's actually not like a conventional density wave. So suppose it was a density wave modulating from left to right. So let's say, you know, the charge is, is low at the first line of oxygens and maybe a little bit higher at the second line and higher at the third line and so on. Um, but if you look horizontally, you'll see that that's actually not <laughs> what's happening. It's something more complicated. And now we know what's actually happening in this situation. It is an electronic liquid crystal, but it's a new state of matter also. 
So here's the two different materials. They both have the same phenomenology. We zoom in, we see the same elementary self-organization at the nanometer scale. And now we know what that is. We figured out what that is. So the left one is BISCO and the right one is oxychloride. In both cases, what's happening is the charge density on the oxygen side is modulating. Let's say black is low charge. Low charge uh, on the left-hand side, high charge in the middle, low charge on the right-hand side. Okay, uh, but that's for the X orbitals in the unit cell. How about for the Y orbitals in the unit cell? Well, it has high charge on the left-hand side and low charge in the middle and high charge on the right-hand side. So the two pieces of the density wave are modulating out of phase with each other. That's a desymmetry form factor density wave. As far as I know, this is the first one which has ever been seen. And amazingly, it appears to play a key role in the cuprate superconductivity. I don't have time to discuss that today, but we're not sure that this object is a genuine charge density wave. We think it's probably a pair density wave. Anyone who wants to send me an email question about that, I would be glad to answer. All right. Let's see, how much time do I have? Okay, good. Now, recently we figured out how to do something extremely interesting. So far, this hasn't produced any scientific breakthroughs, but for me, it was very enjoyable and really, really interesting. Okay, look at this picture. So everyone looking at this talk knows what a flowing fluid looks like, right? It's part of our experience of the world. When a fluid is flowing, we know what the phenomenology should be. Now ask yourselves, have you ever seen a movie of flowing electronic fluids like this? No, there is no such technology, you know, for visualizing, especially at the atomic scale, what's happening to the moving fluid of electrons in a material. Okay, now you can get the uh, you can get a superfluid with a charged superfluid is a superconductor. You can get it to move very fast. If you apply several Tesla, you make an Abrikosov vortex core lattice. There's one flux quantum punching through each vortex core. And of course, that's been known for 50 or 60 years, right? But surrounding each, what is the vortex core? The vortex core is actually a fluid circulating around this place where the order parameter is destroyed. So now if you do the calculation and you say, how fast should the fluid be flowing around my Abrikosov vortex? you find out it's in the range of 10,000 kilometers per second. So when you see those vortex images, you know, they look static, but they're not. The fluid is zooming around there at 10,000 kilometers per second, Mach 10. No one's ever seen that though. Now, how could you see it? Suppose we have a superconductor. Um, so the Fermi, plus Fermi energy, minus Fermi energy are shown, and the superconducting energy gap is shown. And just look at the red lines first. So the red line is the superconducting energy gap for a stationary uh, su superconductor or superfluid. The gap is equal at plus K and minus K. And when you figure out the density of states, it has a sharp peak, and then there's no states inside the gap. Beautiful, but doesn't tell you anything about the fluid flow. What happens if you have a moving superconductor relative to the observer? And we're not talking, um, um, we're talking merely Galilean relativity here, not Lorentzian, just Galilean relativity. But what happens if the superfluid starts moving? Well, now what happens is that the energy of each quasiparticle is boosted by a term. It, it, it's the Galilean boost term. It's the momentum times the velocity. So the ones which are moving in the same direction as the superfluid flow, their energy gets boosted. And the ones moving in the opposite direction, their energy gets depressed. So now if you calculate the density of states, the coherence peak will be split. It'll be split by an energy two delta E. And that split, delta E, is the superfluid velocity divided by H bar Kf. And there's nothing profound here. This is just the Galilean boost of a superconducting condensate moving relative to the observer. If that were happening, you should see this split, okay. Now you can do, you can, you know, work out the simulations. We use a superconducting tip, which I'll tell you more about later. Um, and we can simulate what would be the differential conductance as a function of the relative velocity of the fluid to the tip. If the fluid was moving past the tip at Vs, what would it do to the spectrum? That's what's shown on the right. This has been predicted for decades. Um, Volovic, for example, is a great proponent of this 
splitting of the spectrum due to the Galilean boost. Uh, but it had never been seen. Okay, so now we take a superconducting tip, a niobium diselenide, which is a robust superconductor, apply a magnetic field. There's a vortex right in the middle of the image on the left-hand side. You just see the atoms, but there is a vortex there. And now with very high resolution, less than 20 microvolt energy resolution, we measure the density of states as a function of energy in the same field of view. It looks like this. Okay, you say, so what? But if I put the tip far from the vortex, um, I see one spectrum. And if I put the tip right in the middle of the vortex, I see the only spectrum I see is the spectrum of the tip itself. And in fact, as a function of location, as a function of distance from the symmetry point of the vortex core, the spectrum evolves through a series of quite significant changes. The signal to noise is enormous. Now we know what should happen to the spectrum as a function of energy splitting. So we can fit these measurements everywhere in the field of view and find out what was the energy splitting as a function of location around the vortex. But the energy splitting is the velocity. All you have to do is divide by the Fermi momentum. Then the energy splitting is an image of the velocity. So on the left-hand side, that's actually the first image ever made of the velocity of a flowing uh, superconductor. And uh, indeed, the maximum speed we detected was uh, 3,500 meters per second, right up near the edge of the core. And it decayed away according to Abrakosov's solution. You won't be surprised in a very beautiful way as people have anticipated for decades. But what this means now is we have the technology to see how the condensate is flowing around. How does it go around obstacles? What would the topological surface current of a... Um, of a chiral superconductor looked like. And all kinds of other interesting things could be studied by using this new technique. It's only a couple of years old. Okay. And we had the Josephson effect as well, which I'll tell you about in a second. So we could image the current at the same time, both the velocity and the current. And because the charges are negative, the current goes in the opposite direction to the velocity. Okay. All right, last general topic I want to discuss, okay, I'm doing fine, is the pair density wave state. Now, I told you that to make Cooper pairs in a superconductor, you take a fermion at positive momentum and a fermion at negative momentum, you bind them in a quantum mechanical bound state, and you condense those states. But what would happen if the positive momentum wave vector, Fermi wave vector, was different than the negative momentum wave vector? And that can happen in a spin flip, spin split Fermi surface which is now rather common. When this was proposed, it was very strange, but now spin split Fermi surfaces are available. What will happen is when you bind the two fermions together in a bound state, the sum of their momenta is not zero. So they have a residual momentum Q, and that means they have a wavelength. Now you condense them all into the pair density wave order parameter, which is top center of the screen. You're not condensing particles of plus minus K, you're con condensing particles of plus k, minus k, plus q. So when you make that order parameter, it has a wavelength. It's modulating in space. If you fix the boundaries, let's say at the edge of the sample, then the order parameter will modulate in space. And this was predicted by Fulda, Ferrell, Larkin, and Ovchinikov when I was about two years old. So <laughs> it's a longstanding prediction. If this happens, Ginsburg Landau says that you should have a subsidiary charge modulation as well, which is at twice the wave vector as the pair density modulation. And you know, the, the order parameter is modulating. That means actually the density of condensed pairs is modulating. When the order parameter goes through zero, there are no condensed pairs at that location in space. So it really is a strange new state of matter. It's like a crystal of uh, it's like a gauge symmetry breaking crystal of electron pairs. We call it a pair density wave. You can read about this in some recent review papers. It's, it's a major subject now in uh, quantum matter research. All right, now to see that object, you cannot use a conventional single electron tunneling uh, microscope. Um, the thing which is modulating is an object made of pairs. So to see that object, we had to develop scan Josephson tunneling microscope. Josephson tunneling is tunneling of pairs 
at zero bias from one superconductor to another superconductor. So that makes it obvious what you should do. You should take a superconducting STM tip to study a superconducting sample. And when you work through all the mathematics, and in this overview talk, I don't have enough time to do this, but it's described in the various papers. When you work through all the mathematics, you find out that the differential tunneling conductance of pairs, not the differential tunneling conductance of electrons, but the differential tunneling conductance of pairs uh, will have a large peak at zero voltage. And that's due to the fact that the Cooper pairs are Josephson tunneling from the tip into the sample. That's an established fact. These machines I showed you can also be used as scan Josephson. We, we can change to superconducting tip and otherwise everything will work. So they were designed for that purpose. Actually, these were designed to be scan Josephson STMs. Um, and oh, yes, so I forgot to say that in theory, the as long as the junction resistance is constant as a function of location, then the number of pairs at a given location is indeed the differential tunneling conductance of the pairs at zero voltage. So what you need to measure is the I pair dV at zero voltage. Okay. And you know, inside the gap of a superconductor, there are no single electron excitations to tunnel anyway. So there should be no current there except Josephson tunneling of pairs. Okay. All right. Now let's try to do that for S wave pair density wave. So here is niobium disulfide. It's a very nice charge density wave material and it's a robust superconductor. And given those two components of this coexisting components, Ginzburg-Landau theory would predict that there must be a pair density wave. The electron pair density must modulate in space, in fact, at the same wavelength as the charge density wave. And we wanted to see, is that true? So here's the surface of niobium diselenide. The white dots are selenium atoms. The few impurities you can see for yourself, it's largely a very pure material. If you take the Fourier transform of the atomic locations, you see the Bragg peaks, they're out here at high Q. And there's another set of three peaks. Those are the peaks of the charge density wave modulation, which exists in this compound already at the temperature where we took this picture. All right, now take a superconducting tip, a niobium tip. So at high voltage, when you're far from the energy gap, either of the sample or of the tip, you're just tunneling single electrons. You can measure the charge density. You could measure the charge density wave. If you go down to the energy gap scale, now you have two superconductors. So you can't tunnel single electrons until you provide enough energy to overcome both barriers. So the coherence peaks occur at the sum of the energy gaps. No surprise there. People have known this for 50 or 60 years. But now look very carefully down here at the bottom within a few microvolts of zero, there's another little signal. This is the current uh, at very low voltages. And this is the measured uh, pair differential conductance surrounding zero bias. And now for the experimentalists here, you can imagine this is a tricky experiment because to see the charge density wave, you need tens of millivolts. Um, but to see the pair, to see the pairs, you need to go down to a few microvolts. So the dynamic range is very large. So nevertheless, at high voltage, we image the charge density, no problem. We image the junction resistance as well. I won't belabor you with that, but it's a part of the technique which was required here. Then in the very same field of view, we re reduce the voltage, you know, let's say by a factor of more than a thousand so that we get down into the microvolt range. And now we image the pair conducted, differential conductance in exactly the same field of view. Now, according to the theory, the density of pairs in this field of view, in this compound, would be the uh, pair differential conductance, G0, multiplied by the normal resistance squared, which we couldn't keep constant for this experiment. So this is the theoretical expectation. But we know the normal resistance. We can square it. And we know the zero bias pair conductance. We can multiply them and get a picture of the electron pairs. This is the first picture ever made of the electron pairs um, in a dicocogenide material. And it was a big surprise to us. I'll show you why. So left-hand side now you see charge density modulation. Right-hand side you see pair density modulation measured in exactly the same field. So we can look at the Fourier transform. The left-hand side you see the Bragg peaks of the crystal lattice. And the right-hand side you see the Bragg peaks of the crystal lattice. Some people were surprised by that, but it's correct. 
According to Bloch's theorem, the wave function of the Cooper pairs has to be modulated at the lattice wave vector. So there's nothing surprising about this. But now if you look carefully, there's another set of wave vectors. On the left-hand side, it's the three Q vectors of the single electron charge modulation. On the right-hand side, it's the three Q vectors of the pair density modulation. So now we can uh, Fourier filter away the Bragg peaks and just look at the simultaneous image of charge density and pair density. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first time this has ever been done. Um, and then if there's any experts listening to this talk, you can look at the two images. They're in exactly the same field of view, but they're quite different. You can tell immediately that the pair density does not track the charge density like a slave. They are somehow related, but at this stage, we didn't know how. So to examine that, we can take the Fourier transform. There's actually three density waves. So we just focus on one of them, the charge density wave in this direction, the pair density wave in that direction, measured simultaneously. Now I can plot the charge as an amplitude times the cosine of a wave vector I know, plus the spatial phase of the modulation. And I can plot the pair density as an amplitude times the cosine of the same wave vector. The wave vectors are the same, plus a different phase. And now let's just plot the phase. It tells how the two images are registered to each other in phase. If I plot it this way, it looks like they're tightly registered. And they are. Uh, the edges of these domains you can see are uh, classic uh, discommensuration uh, domain edges. However, to make the two images look the same, we had to shift the phase of the pair density wave everywhere by 2 pi over 3. And that turned out to be what was required. And then if we examine all the other density waves, we get exactly the same result. All pair density waves are out of phase with all charge density waves in space by 2 pi over 3. This is already an outstanding mystery which has not been solved about how CDW and PDW interact with each other. And of course, one reason it hasn't been solved is that no one knew it existed until about two years ago. So, And I'll show you another case a little bit later on. So, so the to, to, visual, to discover that the pair density wave exists is not too shocking. To visualize it is lovely, but it wasn't supposed to be very revealing, but in fact it was. It tells that the pair and charge density waves interact with each other in a way which is not understood. So that was done uh, by, by these two colleagues, Zhao Lang Lu and Rahul Sharma. Oh, and this is done in a transition metal dichalcogenide, and there are many TMDs, which are superconductors and CDW compounds. So we predict there's an abundant new physics in this channel to be discovered by following um, the techniques that I introduce here. All right, how about a D wave? When you bind the Cooper pairs in D wave symmetry, they have angular momentum equal to two if they're in free space. How about a pair density wave of D wave Cooper pairs? Okay. So for about a decade, the strong coupling theorists uh, studying high temperature superconductivity, left-hand side is the phase diagram of a high temperature superconductor, critical temperature versus carrier density with a high temperature superconducting dome in the middle. But theorists all began to say that they think on the low doped side, there is a pair density wave. It should modulate the uh, pairing field. It should modulate the spin density and it should modulate the single electron density in theory. So to search for that, we needed to make a D-wave superconducting tip. You, you can't tunnel Cooper pairs with one symmetry from one superconductor into Cooper pairs with a different symmetry in another superconductor. There's no Josephson current to first order. So we wanted to make a D-wave tip. And the way we did that is by using our conventional normal tip and reaching down and picking up a nanoscale piece of the sample itself of the D wave material itself. And then we can evaluate those, it doesn't always work, but we can evaluate those tips. And we can show, you know, how big is the gap in the tip? We can show that they have atomic resolution. There's two different evaluation experiments on the screen. And then we could carry out these experiments at temperatures down to 50 millikelvin. So this gave us a new experimental capability. As we push that D wave superconducting tip in towards the surface, the distance scale here is in picoamps. We're pushing it towards the surface. So zero is when the tip is far away. 
and we're pushing it forward towards the surface. And as you see immediately, a strong current surrounding zero bias appears. And that is the Josephson current. It's a D-wave Josephson current between the tip and the sample. Now, to measure the superfluid density, essentially we need to measure that current, uh, the maximum in that current. The uh, theory says that it's the maximum in that current, which tells us how much pair condensate there is at a given location. So we need to measure the maximum of that current as a function of location. And in this experiment, we were able to keep the normal resistance constant. So all we have to do is measure the maxima in the current. Okay, so with one of those um, nano D-wave tips, you can see the topographic image of uh, BISCO on the right. If you look carefully, you'll see that it still has atomic resolution. You can see the supermodulation, you can see the bismuth atoms, you can see the disorder. It's perfectly legitimate, legitimate image. If you measure the pair current, maximum in the pair current in the same field of view, you see this. Now, there are some dark spots in there, and they're there deliberately. There are where there are zinc atoms, which are put into the sample because we know the condensate is zero at the zinc atoms. So if the machine is working, the Josephson current should be zero at the zinc atoms, and it is. That's empirical proof that this device does what we see. But if you look away from those disordered regions, you'll see that it's modulating. It's modulating in the northeast and northwest directions quite strongly, actually. Um, and if you take the Fourier transform of the Josephson current, it has two very clear modulations with four unit cell periodicity. We were amazed and del delighted to discover this. There is a pair density wave in the underdoped cuprates, and now that's a focus of a great deal of ongoing study all over the world. But this is a D wave uh, crystal of uh, high TC electron pairs, really an exotic state. Okay, I think this is the last thing I'm going to think about and this or talk about, and this is the experiment we just finished a couple of months ago. So uh, it's been on the desk and on the mind. P wave. Where would you get a P wave superconductor? Well, uh, well, of course, uh, those of us of a certain age know that you could get a P wave superfluid because uh, superfluid helium three is P wave, but superconductors they're very rare. 2019, this new material appeared, uranium ditelluride. The bulk characteristics are strongly indicative that it is a P-wave superconductor, although the order parameter is not proven yet. Um, it, it's, I'm willing to bet that it is a P-wave superconductor. Let's put it that way. Uh, and it's a very nice compound uh, for STM, except for a few tricky bits, but we don't have to belabor that. Last year, uh, Vidya Madhavan discovered that in this compound, there is a strong charge density wave. Now that's that's not, it's absolutely beautiful discovery, but it's not shocking. It's a dicalcogenide and many dicalcogenides um, have charge density waves and apparently so does this one. So there is a charge density wave in this compound. And our understanding of the problem is, and it is a superconductor. So our understanding of the problem is if it is a superconductor and if it has a charge density wave, it should have a pair density wave. So here, and so we began those experiments. Here's the surface of that compound. Now I show you the cleave surface relative to the Fermi surface and the energy gap on the right-hand side, because it cleaves on a somewhat strange plane between the Y and the Z axis. Um, but that's, that's, that's just for honesty, that doesn't change our conclusions. It's just that the experiment is done at this strange angle to the canonical uh, lattice vectors of the crystal. The surface, though, is beautiful. You can do very nice experiments. So, of course, Fidia was exactly right. There is a charge density wave in this material. If we visualize the density of states at high energy outside the superconductivity, take the Fourier transform, we see the Bragg peaks. But then we see three more peaks, which he had discovered. And those three peaks are the three peaks of a charge density modulation in this compound. There they are. Now we wanted to visualize the uh, pairs. So, okay, you think Josephson, but to visualize Josephson, you need a P wave tip and we don't have a P wave tip. So instead we tried to visualize the energy gap itself, the pair field itself. That would be enough to show that it is a pair density wave. But 
that also didn't produce a very good result. And the reason is that in the dense, this is the measured density of states as a function of voltage at very low temperatures, 280 millikelvin on the surface on the left-hand side. But you almost see no energy gap whatsoever. And the same thing is reported by many groups. And the proposal is that that's happening because there is a topological surface state with finite density of states uh, between the tip and the bulk superconductor. Okay, I'm not going to address that question here today, but if it's true, it prevents us from measuring the energy gap uh, of the bulk superconductor with any clarity. So instead, what we did is we changed to a superconducting tip. It, with a superconducting tip, you can greatly enhance the energy resolution. Just to put some numbers on it, if you take a normal tip at 300 millikelvin, you can have energy resolution in tunneling due to the width of the Fermi function, which is about 75 microvolts. But under exactly the same conditions, if you take a superconducting tip, because the coherence peak is so sharp, you can have energy resolution maybe five microvolts. So it's a massive improvement in the energy resolution. So that's what we did. Took a niobium tip, um, then the spectrum tunneling into um, uranium ditelluride is shown on the right. Now you see two very sharp peaks whose energy we can measure quite accurately. We can measure the spatial variation of the energy of the uh, em of the filled states, that's on the right, and the spatial variation of the energy of the empty states, that's on the left. And so now we can uh, measure the energy gap. You take the distance between those two peaks, divide by two. That's the gap of the super superconductor plus the tip. So then you subtract the tip gap, which you've measured independently, and that gives you the variation of the energy gap of the superconductor. Now, when we take the Fourier transform, there are three new peaks. These peaks are not charge modulations. they are modulations in the pair field holding the Cooper pairs together. They mean there is a pair density wave in this compound. If we inverse Fourier filter them, we can see the pair density wave quite clearly. And furthermore, we can see the charge density wave simultaneously. So again, the two images are not the same. I'm kind of getting used to this now. The charge density and the pair density have are not master and slave to each other. They have some other very interesting relationship, which is not understood. What we know in this case is they're out of phase by pi. So wherever the charge density is high, the pair density is low, and wherever the charge density is low, the pair density is high, but we don't know why. That's, and this, this publication is only about a month old, so this really is an open question. All right, um, but anyway, we think that this is the first observation of a spin triplet P wave pair density wave. And we're going to try and move on from that point as soon as possible. Uh, and so here are the colleagues who carried out that experiment. All right. So the last thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, this is a massive internet. It isn't just me fooling around. This is a massive international effort of highly distinguished colleagues working together material science, theory of different kinds, uh, experiments of different kinds to corroborate, developments, you know, when we ask for new materials to be synthesized according to our requirements, our colleagues are very cooperative. So the, you know, history and capability of visualization of electronic matter uh, of the type that I just showed you during this talk really redounds to the credit of the people that you see on the screen here. It is a community effort, which luckily for all of us has worked out. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Davis, uh, for a very stimulating talk. Uh, we have Dr. Utpal Roy, who will help us uh, conduct the question answer session. Utpal? Yeah, hi. So yeah, Professor Davis, you know, thank you for giving such an amazing talk uh, with a lot of informations and uh, definitely demands a lot of uh, investigation following your remarkable experiments uh, to have uh, 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 a kind of innovative imaging of quantum matters of different form. So I'm sure that there will be a, a number of questions from uh, the audience. Uh, so I request uh, the audience, uh, anybody wants to ask any question, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask questions or else you can write the question in the chat box. Yeah, I think there's one. 
yeah so there is one question written in the chat box and just read out i'll just read out for you I yeah i have a question regarding pw tdw does the information of finite momentum pair allow a coexistence of magnetism and superconductivity right so for s wave pairs we don't that's a great question for s wave pairs we don't expect that there would be any magnetic component of the PDW, okay? But for P-wave pairs, there are many P-wave superconductors which are themselves magnetic because it's a spin one system and so, some of the spin one eigenstates are magnetic. So it's formally possible that the P-wave um, PDW states could also be like a Cooper pair spin density wave. That also would be a strange new state of matter, but at least in theory, that's a possibility. We, we really haven't reached the point of exploring those excellent questions yet. Yeah, so that is uh, the answer of uh, Raghav's question. Is there any other question? Uh, yeah, I have another question. Uh, um, maybe, uh, maybe a silly question question but uh, i would like to know uh, how how does one prepare a superconductor with pairs having opposite i mean uh, the center of mass is non zero the center of mass of the momentum is non zero how is it possible so in the traditional explanation um, the fulda farrell larkin of chinikov explanation you would take a metal and apply a very high magnetic field and if you remember your poly um, paramagnetism, what that will do is it'll enhance the number of states which are polarized with the field and it'll deplete the number of states which are polarized against the field. But that means that the first case has a larger Fermi wave vector and the second case has a smaller Fermi wave vector. And then, then they predicted that if those pairs would bind, you'd end up with a finite momentum Cooper pair. Now, to the best of my knowledge, that state has never been detected, certainly hasn't been detected by visualization. Uh, but that was the elementary proposal for how it would happen. Now, if you go to the other extreme limit, which is the cube rates, in the cube rates, the theorists say that if you take the Hubbard model and reduce it to the TJ model and then solve it numerically, um, you typically find D-wave superconductivity, but oftentimes you find another state at approximately the same energy, which is modulating in space, and that's a pair density wave. So those are two components of the answer to your question. Yeah, any more questions? So there is a question in the chat. Yeah, please. please go ahead. Yeah. In the chat? In the chat. Yeah, I don't see any right now. Uh, yeah, so yes, there is one more question. Uh, generally, CTW and superconductivity are known to compete with or com uh, or complement each other, would you be able to see such behavior with TDW as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So we attempted, I didn't have time to talk about that, but we attempted that experiment in um, niobium diselenide. If you look at our paper, you'll see the answer, but I can summarize it. So you have, uh, at the lowest temperature, you have three order parameters. You have the superconductor, you have the CDW, and you have the PDW. But we can turn off the superconductor by applying a high magnetic field and killing it in the core of the Abercasov vortex. That should do nothing to the CDW. And if the theory is correct, it should suppress the PDW because the PDW is being maintained by the superconducting order parameter. So when we did that experiment, that's exactly what we found. That, that means there is a fairly simple Ginzburg-Landau representation for those simple materials of how the three order parameters interact with each other, validated by experiment. Now, just to amplify a little bit, uh, we were not surprised by that result, but we do not know what the same result is in the cube rates. There, we would very much like to manipulate the superconductor and see does the pair density wave get stronger or weaker? That's an outstanding question that remains to be answered. Yeah, there's any more question? I don't know, is there any question in the YouTube uh, side? Uh, Somebody is writing in the chat. 
Was it Deshmukh? Is there any way that we can? Um, yeah, I am checking that. There is no yeah. question from the YouTube right now. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I think we can ask from the audience and uh, yeah, any. Fine. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, one more time. Is there any question from the audience? Any more question? We can take maybe one more. Okay. Yeah, this this really has been a brilliant session. So yes. Um, so go home and have your dinner. <laughs> well, uh, uh, let, let, let me invite uh, Dr. Shavani to help us conclude the session. Shavani. Yeah, uh, sir, I'll take the opportunity to ask one question to Professor. Yes, of course. Yeah, actually, I have many questions. Uh, <laughs> I'll write him later on. I'll not uh, bother him by asking many things. But I have a lot of curiosity to ask. Uh, yeah, Professor Davies, actually, you know, is that statement uh, valid that, you know, I would say that uh, pH density wave is uh, maybe thought of as appropriate order parameter of the system? So... A purist would say um, it, it, the ideal case would be you could have, let's say, three materials. And in each material, one would be a homogeneous superconductor, one would be a CDW, and one would be a pair density wave. That would be a simple world in which we could try to understand this problem. But so far, all cases that we have studied and that every other group has studied, they are coexisting. So it's, it's not clear to us whether the coexistence is somehow a co coincidence or a requirement. But at present, all we know is the relative relationship between the CDW, the superconductor, and the PDW. And, you know, the way the world works, you have to study what exists, not what could exist. So <laughs> yes, that's yes. What because I can see that there are relations between CDW and PDW by their phase difference. And uh, so it, it suggests that, you know, we can probably uh, tell one of them as a good order parameter of the system, not the both of them. So I, I don't know, that may be that's, the open question, yeah. That's certainly possible. That, that's a perfectly valid open question. Yeah. yeah. Because of the phase shift between the PDW and the CDW, I would say that at present, there is no guaranteed ginsburg landau representation of what's going on, which is completely predictive, right? That's where we are in this new field. Yes. So just just one more thing that is there any possibility that we can have we can also study the interaction of uh, pH density waves of two superconductors, maybe uh, uh, topologically indistinguishable or uh, whichever way it is. Yeah. So, OK, I, I, pre I, I presume the answer is yes, but I, I haven't thought about that subject. OK, yeah, yeah. Okay. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So we can go for yeah, concluding. Yeah. Shravani? Yeah. So on behalf of all participants and organizing committee, uh, we would like to express our gratitude to Professor Seamus Davis for his thrilling talk on the topic of uh, the imaging of exotic states. And uh, it's really full of strange beauty uh, of all the images which we observed in last uh, one hour. And um, with this, we conclude the session now with the thank to all the audience um, who are participating right now in this meeting. Thank all you. Right. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. This has been great fun. I'd be happy to do it again. <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, the, you, sh you should certainly plan a visit to India and uh, do come down to Tirupati. All right, thanks a lot. Bye. Yeah. Okay. So I can out. see one audience is having questions. I request him or her to write uh, directly to Professor Davies for okay. for any queries. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much. Goodbye. <laughs>